Hi everyone, I hope you're not done with this. Is the coin fair? Lesson 34, hypothesis tests for P, uh, which remember is a population proportion or probability. Uh, so a politician would care about share of the vote, for example. All right, let's do hypothesis tests for P, lesson 34. For a fixed sample size N, we assume that we have a binomial experiment. Uh, so you remember that uh, we flip a fair coin a hundred times or in a poll, we randomly sample a thousand people. Uh, we can assume independence because of the sampling rule and so forth. If X is the number of successes, like the number of heads or the number of people who are for Senator Smith, uh, then we can assume that X has a binomial distribution, NP. So N is the fixed sample size. That's no surprise. But now P is unknown. Okay. We don't know truly what Senator Smith is going to get. Uh, we don't know truly what this coin really is or does, unless we do a, a, a physics analysis or something. <laughs> All right, so you take this coin, this magician's coin, and you flip it a bunch of times. You, you flip it N times, so your sample size is N. So what's your best point estimate? What's your best point estimate? The sample proportion P hat, which is the number of heads or the number of successes over the number of flips, the sample size. So the number of successes over the sample size or the number of trials. Okay. So for example, uh, if you get 51 heads in 100 flips, then the sample proportion p hat uh, is given by 51 over 100, 0.51. And that's our best guess for a p, the true probability of heads on this coin. All right, now remember that for a normal approximation, we need to verify that NP is at least five and NQ is at least five under the null. So remember, the null hypothesis is going to say that P takes on a particular value. P takes on a particular value and therefore Q takes on the complement. So under the null, See, under the assumption the null is true, we have values for P and Q. Uh, so for example, if the null says the coin is fair, then we're assuming P is 0.5, and therefore Q is also 0.5. One minus 0.5 is 0.5. So these values would go in here. And N would be in the number of flips. So remember, there is a bit of arrogance here. It's, it's kind of like the presumption of innocence. We're assuming for now the null is true. So we're assuming for now that we have, in this case, a fair coin. Again, we will temporarily assume that the null is true. So we will use the reference value for P, like the point half, the point five here, or one half, the reference value for P, and the corresponding value for Q, which is the complement, one minus P, when we do this verification. And also later on, we'll use these values for P and Q. For convenience, we will not be using continuity corrections, uh, although we could use them to be more accurate. Okay. So now, before we get to the idea of a p-value, uh, the, we're going to talk about test statistics. And a test statistic is a single number that we get based on the sample and what we're doing with our test, right? Uh, what the null says, what the alternative says. We're going to use the Z test statistic as a way of summarizing the data relative to what we're doing, right? What the hypothesis test is. In particular, what's the hypothesized value for P and therefore the hypothesized value for Q under the null. So all of these are under the null. I'll, I'll do this. <laughs> so we're going to plug in values for P, P over here, and Q under 
the null. Remember, for the time being, we're going to assume that the null is true. And remember, the null in this lesson, the null is saying something like P is 0.5, for example. All right. So before we get to P value, we're going to get the test statistic, which is a number that summarizes the results from a sample relative to these hypothesized values under the null. Okay, so it's going to help us decide whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. And we're going to use distributions like Z, like T, like chi-square to help us calculate the test statistic and decide what to do about the null. So this is a number that's going to help us figure out what to do about the null. And eventually the p-value may be wrapped up in this as well. So here is the Z test statistic for test for p. Here's the formula. All right. So now, when does this formula make sense? So let x be the number of successes in n trials of a random variable. If x has a binomial distribution, np, then x has this distribution. Okay, now this is theory. So folks, yeah, don't freak out too much. I want to explain why it is that this formula makes sense. I'll make this quick. <laughs> so remember X has a binomial distribution. Uh, this is the distribution for like the number of heads on say a hundred flips of a fair coin. We're assuming for now the coin is fair. Uh, P hat is X over N, right? You take the number of heads divided by the number of flips that gets you the sample proportion. And it has this distribution where you divide these guys, mean and standard D by N. So then we get these values for the mean and standard deviation for our normal approximation, all right? And then you can go through the Z formula. You go through the Z formula, all right? Uh, plug in these values for the uh, mean and the standard deviation, all right? Uh, where we're considering the number of heads, for example, all right? If you divide the top and the bottom by N, you, you have things in terms of proportions, all right? Uh, and uh, again, we're using the fact that uh, p hat is x over n, number of successes over number of uh, trials. There you go. So it comes through from the algebra. Don't freak out too much about this. All right. Coin examples. Example one, the magician's coin. And also we're going to explain why we never accept the null hypothesis. This will be a two-tailed test and we're going to revisit a prior lesson. Okay, so uh, as in that uh, lesson 33, example one, we want to test the claim that a magician's coin is fair at the 0 0.05 significance level. Let P be the probability that the coin comes up heads. Here's the setup for this two-tailed test. All right, so the magician's coin is fair. Test the claim that a magician's coin is fair. Hmm, okay, yeah, like this. A magician's coin is fair. All right, so that's going to be our claim. It's, it's already bold based there. A magician's coin is fair. All right, so that means that uh, the claim is that P, the probability of heads, is one half or 0.5. So this is going to be the claim based on the wording. Fair coin. P equals one half because this is the case of equality where P equals the reference value, that's going to correspond to the null hypothesis. The assumption is that uh, if the claim corresponds to just the case of equality, then the alternative here suggests a two-tailed test. P is not one half or 0.5. And we have a two-tailed test because the alternative favors both high values and low values, both the right tail and the left tail for this P number line. Alpha is a significance level is given, 0 
All right. Now remember, you're not supposed to cheat. Do not gather sample data until after the setup has been determined. So remember, all of this over here has to be determined before you flip that coin, all right? Don't touch that coin. <laughs> Don't touch that coin until you set up this experiment and you set up this hypothesis test. Now, at this point, we gather sample data. That means flip the coin. Let's say the coin is flipped 100 times and it comes up heads 51 times. All right. Now, the rounding instructions will vary, but here we're going to round off to four significant digits, except we're going to round off the Z test statistic to two decimal places. It's usually, stand, it's usually standard that the Z test statistic would be rounded to two decimal places because of tables and uh, some software. So the sample size, N equals 100 coin flips. The number of successes, X is 51 heads. The sample proportion, our point estimate for the true probability of heads is X over N, 51 over 100, or 0.5 100, 0 0.5100, four significant digits. And then we're going to verify that normal approximations are appropriate in this problem. So under the null, right, we have to show that NP is at least five. And NQ is at least five. Now, I know before that we used to take the number of successes, but over here, look, this is not NP hat or X. This is NP. It's under the null. So you do not take the 51 up here. <laughs> and is 100. P is 1 half under the null, right? 100, 100 times a half is 50. 50 is at least 5. Check. Under the null, n q, well, n is 100, 100 flips. If p is a half, then q is a half. 100 times a half is 50, that's at least five. Okay, so normal approximations are appropriate. So remember, if p is 1 half, it's good to know that q is also 1 half, or 0.5. Okay, we compute the z-test statistic. This is the given formula for the z-test statistic. Now, the 0 0.5100, that's based on the sample, 51 heads in 100 flips. P hat is 0 0.5100. You can just put 0 0.51, but, uh, well, I said four sig figs, just to be safe. I mentioned that because if you do some rounding in the bottom, for example, then uh, maybe four sig figs. <clears throat> Okay, uh, <clears throat> and then under the null, under the null, oh, let's write this in red. Okay, under the null, P under the null is 0.5. Remember, the null hypothesis says, way up here, the null hypothesis says P equals one half or 0.5. All right, 0.5 right here. Make sure not to switch these, otherwise you'll get the wrong sign. Over, and remember, these are P and Q under the null, so it's the 0.5. Remember, this is usually the nicer number, right? So uh, we're lucky it's the P, not the P hat. It's 0.5 times Q is 0.5 over and is 100. You take the square root down there, work this all out, you get 0 0.20 to two decimal places. The Z test statistic is 0 0.20. Now, right off the bat, right off the bat, without even doing P values or all that, a Z score of 0 0.20, think about that. Does that mean that our sample results are that unusual? Again, think about it. <laughs> the null hypothesis is saying the coin is fair. P is one half. We got 51 heads out of 100. Do you think we're going to reject the null? <laughs> Use your common sense. <laughs>
No, probably not, right? Okay, note that a z-score of 0.20 seems very close to zero. See, if we had a z-score that was like above two, especially way above two or less than negative two, then we might, be, we might suspect that the null might get rejected. Maybe, maybe not. But if your z-score is that close to zero, a 0.2, it's highly unlikely we're going to reject the null, just from our common statistical sense. The null, uh, sorry, uh, uh, zero here corresponds to the null. See, if we'd gotten exactly 50 heads out of 100, the z-score would have been zero, which would have perfectly reflected the null. Still, we would not have accepted the null, but a z-score of zero would have been a perfect reflection of what the null is saying. A z-score of zero means like you get 50 heads out of 100 flips. This is still pretty close. 51 heads out of 100 flips, we get 0 0.20 as our z-score. So it looks like getting 51 heads out of 100 flips seems to present little evidence against the null. If the z-score was zero, we'd have no evidence against the null. But even a 0 0.20, that's still little evidence against the null. Now, if the z-score were like 20 or something, we have, we'd have huge evidence against the null. <laughs> Go straight to jail like in Monopoly. <laughs> All right. Now that we have our z-test statistic, we can now find the corresponding p-value. And of course, I'll give you relevant hints as necessary. In real life, you might go to Excel. So remember, the z-score is 0 0.20, and it's a two-tailed test. So we need a two-tailed p-value. So we're going to mark off on this z-bell, right? Well, the, the z-distribution corresponds to a normal bell curve. On the z-axis, we're going to mark off the positive 0 0.20 and the negative 0 0.20. They're very close. <laughs> I give you uh, this hint that there's 0 0.4207 in both the left tail and the right tail. The two tail p-value, or twice 0 0.4207, is 0 0.8414. Okay, so we're now going to decide whether or not to reject the null. Again, before I even show you, before we even get to there, right? Remember the idea. What's the threshold for what it means to be unusual? It is alpha, which is 0 0.05 here, the standard. When do we reject the null? When the p-value is low. If the p-value is low, the null must go. the p-value is low, the null must go. Okay, wait a minute. 0.8414. You know, I, I don't really even have to look at your value for alpha. No one's alpha value is above 50% or 0.5. If your alpha value is point, if your alpha value is above 0.5, then that means that you're shocked that a coin comes up heads. <laughs> okay, no one's alpha value is above 0.5. This two-tail p-value, even the one-tail p-value, but certainly the two-tail p-value, this is massive over 84%, come on. Whatever your alpha value is realistically, it's not gonna be low. We now decide whether or not to reject the null. Okay, the p-value is 0.8414. Is it low? Is it less than alpha? No, it's greater than alpha. The p-value is not low. The p-value compared to alpha, the p-value is not low compared to alpha. It's way up here, way, 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 way up there. The p-value is not low, we do not reject the null. Which satisfies our common sense, right? Because, again, the null said that the coin is fair. And if the coin comes up heads 51 times out of 100, well, no, we're not going to reject the null, not with any reasonable value for alpha. Okay. <clears throat> so now we're going to write our final conclusion relative to the claim. We do not reject the null. I'll put this in blue. We do not reject the null. Is that strong or weak? That's weak. <laughs> that's weak. I sound like a teenager. Okay, that's weak. <laughs> okay, no offense to teenagers. We do not reject the null. That's weak. There is insufficient evidence. <laughs> 
Okay, there's insufficient evidence to say such and such. Okay, there's insufficient evidence. What? What was the claim? The null was the claim. The null is the claim. So the null is on trial. How are we, how are we weighing evidence? We're weighing evidence against that claim, against that null claim. That the magician's coin is fair. That was the null. So again, the first part, remember, comes from the decision. Okay. The first part comes from the decision. The second part comes from what the claim is. The claim. Which one was it? <laughs> all right. Was the claim the null or the alternative? Conclusion. Let's put all together. Mix and match. <laughs> Conclusion. There is insufficient evidence against the claim that the magician's coin is fair. Let's read it through. Okay. Think about it. The null says, or the claim is, right? The claim was that the coin was fair. Remember? And it's good to indicate what the claim is. Okay, it's good to write claim. Okay, the null is the claim. The null claim is that the coin is fair. The null claim is that the coin is fair. The null claim is that the coin is fair. The coin came up heads 51 times out of 100. Well, uh, uh, since the since the knows the claim, we're weighing evidence against the claim. It's on it's on trial. All right, we have this coin on trial. We have this coin on trial. the The claim is that this coin is fair. Do we have enough evidence against that claim? All right, are we ready to say guilty? You flip the coin, grab that coin from the <laughs> that uh, uh, seat in the jury room. All right, the witness stand, <laughs> grab that coin, you flip it 100 times, it comes up heads 51 times. Are you going to have sufficient evidence against the claim that the coin's fair? If David says my coin's fair, are you going to say he's a liar? Probably not, right? There is insufficient evidence. There's not enough evidence against the claim that the magician's coin is fair. Now, the coin did come up heads 51 times, not 50 times out of 100. So there's some evidence, a teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny bit of evidence against the claim that the coin's fair, but it's insufficient. It's not enough. All right. And again, even though we don't reject the null, we never accept the null. Why not? Well, since p hat, our sample proportion was 0.51, the most likely value for p uh, wasn't 0.51, it was, oh, sorry, the, uh, the, the most likely value for P was not 0 0.50, which was what the null says, is 0.51, all right? If P has 0.51, the most likely value for P is 0.51, not 0 0.50. And even if you had gotten 50 heads on 100 flips, right? Even if your P hat were 0 0.5 on the dot, again, P could have easily been, say, 0.51 or 0.49, and the 0 0.50 could have been the result of sampling error. So basically, when we don't reject the null, we're chalking things up to sampling error. 